My name is Jay Alvarez. I made a movie called I Play With The Phrase Each Other, and it's about uh, young aesthetes who are slowly dying in a very squalid urbanity. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your process of creating a story like this that relied so heavily upon the spoken word, but in the sense that it was almost like poetry, that it wasn't just uh, you know, dialogue to kind of get us from point A to point B, but really some words and, and uh, significant phrases that got us deep into the psyche of the characters and really brought these characters out from just being such interesting 20-somethings kind of populating this space and um, this multi-character mosaic that really just interwove so many different storylines so seamlessly. It's a little inherently difficult to respond to a question with so much praise, but, uh, but I'll, I'll, uh, I will uh, bend. So obviously I'm shooting on a cell phone because you shot your entire movie on a cell phone. This entire movie was made out of cell phone calls. Why choose to film it in the way that you did? Why did you decide to do that? What made you choose to tell this story? Why this story? This is my debut feature film, and it was a very elegant mistake. And the movie for me began as a commission. The film was a commission. I entered the project um, as a commission. I was involved several years ago in an organization whose name I can't specify, but whose purpose concerned a resistance against certain forms of wireless pollution in America. And there was an individual in this organization. There was a man in this organization, a leader. And the leader of the group who made the major decisions. And he wrote to me uh, after reading something that I'd written, uh, a piece of short fiction that someone had sent him, which he was fond of. He wrote to me with an offer, which at the time was very advantageous. And the offer he was making was an exchange for me writing a film, which I'd never done before in which several young characters, through their incessant use of cell phones and other forms of wireless communication, develop malignant brain tumors and die. I accepted the offer. And I began to write the script, but before I could finish it, the man himself died in a car crash. He was killed in a car. And even though our relationship was fragmented dramatically, and I received a very small portion of his offer up front, I continued to work on the movie. And I finished the script, and we went into production using money that I had raised selling musical equipment on Craigslist. So, in the original script, did someone have brain cancer? Yeah, when, when my employer died, it created a really ambivalent freedom because it felt eerie to continue the movie after his passing, but I enjoyed a lot of the control it gave me. Um, I was able to omit a lot of monotonous content, for instance, all the young deaths. I guess the other challenge in this film had to be um, how to create something kinetic out of, out of a series of, of cell phone calls. So, and, and I think you succeeded brilliantly at that, but I, I wonder how you, how you conceptualized that um, in, in the creation of it. The writing was fairly ingenuous and automatic. Um, there was, a, uh, there was a, a certain uh, compulsion that led me to it, and, and while, I, I've, while I've never made a movie before, um, because I'm not uh, dyslexic, uh, so I've never been drawn to them. I, I found that movies are really good for dyslexic people because the world is made intelligible for them by reducing it to images. Um, it's a great era for them. Uh, photographic phones now deliver anecdotes for the inarticulate. Now it's this. Did you see this? This is what happened. And uh, they can brandish their disability like it was a language. They can call the language, and they do. And good for them. After years of torment in the classroom, <laughs> all those awful moments being called onto the next paragraph, now they have a camera to capture the way things appear. Can you tell us a little bit about the process of casting the film? I saw that you cast the film. Um, did you know any of these actors? Are they some of your collaborators? To begin with Megan, uh, I was, uh, there was a time when I was working uh, uh, as a security guard at a bookstore. Um, I was hired to work as a, a security guard um, there, uh, mainly because of my size. Um, I, don't, I don't look like much now, but I'm in pedestrian clothes. Uh, when you put me in a uniform and hand me a walkie-talkie, I transform into something very frightening. Um, the reason there's a security guard at all at the bookstore is because uh, they sold more than books. They sold things like television uh, that sell and resell and get stolen. And I was hired to stop the thieves. Um, I wasn't terribly good at it, but I made a lot of friends. And, with, with the thieves and, and with a few particular uh, very beautiful employees. 
one of which was Megan Kopp. Megan was working in middle management. She was suffering and enjoying martyrdom. And, uh, and we befriend each other. Um, I, I, I discovered Megan, uh, I want to take back that partial air quote. I discovered Megan when she, uh, Megan was famous for her overhead announcements. At the end of the shift, everyone would have to leave and the person, uh, the person signed to making this overhead announcement was Megan. And she would get on the intercom and perform this task with this brilliance, this, that really special brilliance of the unnoticed proletariat um, that, that, that speaks with this, the person, the kind of like, the kind of person who makes you feel fortunate to be in this underexposed venue of a great performer. Uh, someone who's speaking um, in, in uh, someone who separates themselves from average people speaking average ways, uh, thinking average thoughts. She was transcending this small life that we were making together. Will Hand, in a ninth grade classroom, everyone in the class was assigned in a geometry class to demonstrate for the rest of the class how the Pythagorean theorem worked. Will Hand had written a word problem in which he compared the Pythagorean theorem to a group of lost Boy Scouts in the woods who were forced to spend their time tying knots and building tree houses. I adored his presentation, and I adored his voice, and I never spoke to him, but seven years later, after the script had been written, I knew that he would play Jake. There was no one else who could do it, so I tracked him down digitally, and we spoke to each other, and the affinity I sensed, the, the, um, the inevitability I, I sensed seven years earlier, uh, hearing about Lost Boy Scouts, came true, and I sent him the script, and uh, he read it and he told me that the, the words in the script were what he was afraid of, of saying in his sleep. And this made me... <laughs> and this made me... <laughs> and I'm betraying a little bit of confidence here, but this made me very happy. And, uh, and, and, we, 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 and we began uh, reciting the lines to, to each other over the phone for a year. Standing to his right, the very talented... <laughs> endlessly endearing, with... Exemplary bone structure, <laughs> Mr. Alexander Fraser. Fraser came into my house. One of the one of the, the, the more initially conventional uh, casting experiences. Alexander Fraser was the first person to understand resentment in the mind of Zane. He was the first person to read the lines and observe italics that didn't exist on the page. We got into the part in the, in the beginning of the movie where he's talking about Sean, and Alexander said. What does Sean do? And that was it. He had he had a part. Uh, I thought there was definitely a, like a style to the acting that it was kind of across the board. Everybody seemed to be on the same page. And I'm just wondering if that was something that came out like organically, or is that something you worked with with each actor to make sure there was that style throughout the whole piece? Yeah. Well, uh, Jay and I rehearsed the film for a, like a solid year, he and I, uh, over, the, over the phone. But I think more importantly, Jay is uh, uh, a very sort of um, contagious person, and he has a very contagious personality. I think even coming back, I'm surprised to see that the people who are in his presence now have been, you know, working with him since, you know, Ray talks more like him now than he ever did. You know, everybody's changing. He just has a very uh, sort of, you know, developed sense and the, the rhythm and the, the comedy uh, really comes out, you know, when you sort of know what of Jay you're supposed to be pulling out of the text. Why you chose to um, shoot in black and white? Well, I'm, I'm colorblind, so Why are you actually we took color out of the movie and we, yeah, <laughs> we placed it with the rest of the content in this life that I'm incapable of understanding. <laughs> that really vulgar group that includes math and multitasking. So is, is every film you're going to shoot to the back I would assume so until a large wallet approaches me. <laughs> it looks pretty good. What cell phone did you use? It was an iPhone 4. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. A uh, cell phone is something different in a born cinematography. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very acute pleasure for me to watch someone with a gift use, with significantly more talent, the same toy that we're all given.
it's amazing. The look of the movie is a combination of a very gifted cinematographer and the inevitability of walking into an extremely squalid location and walking out of it with, your, with all of your perceptions eclipsed by the atmosphere of the environment. You can walk into any of the hotels, any of the flop houses in which we filmed, and you're going to walk out, you're going to exit the building with grain in your eyes. I, I thought it was also fascinating how, how your character, um, Sean, talks about um, his, his idea of, of how to live in, in relative poverty. And uh, I think it's almost the first thing we've seen with the way the economy's changed in the last five, ten years, where, where you have people, young people just coming out of college age um, talking about really embracing the idea of living without money. I've, I've, uh, I've entered a, a very long campaign of, or rather a very long attempt of cultivating elegant poverty. Uh, not out of choice, but I, I, found a, I found a result that I'm fond of. I've, it, 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 uh, it's uh, imperative that there exists demitasse cups <laughs> and, uh, and plenty of uh, paperback novels. This movie's coming from a severity of experience that demands and very much requires a complete dismissal of, um, of gratuitous technology to capture the crisis. The more that we wandered away from paper and pen, the more that we would uh, we would f we would become lost in disposable culture. I have to ask you about the the, the one the ten minute scene that's just on the boss um, reacting to the um, to the answering machine message. So I filled out another form, and I was ushered into his office. And just like before, he didn't say anything. And I told him why I was there. And just like before, he listened and nodded. And then, just like the first time, he looked at me and he said. We just don't have the payroll. I think it works brilliantly, but it almost seems like a provocation to in, in the you know the current current you know world of how things are done. Um, did, did you see it as a provocation at all, or was it just something that that, that worked for the film? I wasn't conscious of it, its time length. Uh, I'm I'm not I'm not very uh, film literate, um, as oxymoronic as that sounds to me most of the time. Um, so I, I don't have a reference point for subversion. <laughs> <laughs> what do you expect? Like today is your premiere, right. and you have a lot to do. And what are you expecting from the festival? Like what are you hoping for? Um, I'm hoping that the movie is going to capture the hearts of young, slender women like Megan, with pale skin and large ears sticking out of their hair. It's a little bit poking out. I hope the movie will soften my interactions with other people. I'd like to think that uh, the movie will inspire more mothers to find my appreciation of their babies endearing instead of ominous and creepy. Um, a lot of mothers are really great and they see my appreciation and they wink at me, which is fantastic. I wish that was the reaction all mothers had. Um, I'd like to think that the movie will inspire more maternal winking.
I guess the first thing that really jumps out in this movie is, is uh, your style of writing. It's so idiosyncratic. I just loved uh, the characters. I love your use of language. It kind of feels like the, the, the different parts are written sort of very much in, in your style and, and with your voice, and yet they, like there's kind of a like a... Uh, a little bit of a different take on it from each one of you, so I wonder how, how in performing you uh, conceptualize that. Jay was very specific about the way he, he wanted to film the movie. Jay, he, uh, he has a very specific rhythm with his writing, and he's a very hands-on director. I, I felt at ease in his hands. It was a great experience. But like, in what sense a hand on, hands on director? Well, my, my hands are rather small and small sometimes, <laughs> but it, it does feel comfortable to be inside them. <laughs> well, speaking of rhythm, how did the actors find their own rhythm for each character? Because obviously the words are laid out in a certain way on the page, but you brought something to it to have a certain inflection and certain, you know, uh, movement to the highs and the lows of each, you know, delivery. And I'm curious, was that a big discussion with Jay, or did you sort of work it out through with your individual characters? I mean, you know, the thing I think about this film is that it really was a, I mean, it was a 30 take per shot film, you know, if that, I mean, that was 30 shot, 30 take minimum um, for this, for at least for all my scenes. I kind of, I don't, I suck, I mean, I'm not very good, so obviously, you know, Jay needed to kind of, you know, tease that out, um, but I think, you know, from take one to take 30, you're, you're going to know, I mean, he, yeah, he knows how it's supposed to sound, and in 30 takes, he can let you know. Can you talk a little bit about the, just the production process, how long you guys shot for? Um, to speak of time length, a movie like this begins in childhood. <laughs> I started writing The Womb. And uh, so it's, it's been almost 24 years now in production. Uh, everyone's remained very patient. I've lived it the longest. Um, regarding uh, production in general, uh, it was rife with conflict, but we've experienced a certain transcendence. Uh, it was um, it was funded by an ecstatic agony, and we've continued it. It's not finished. Uh, just to just to elucidate a comment, um, there's a every single copy is a working cut. So the Blu-ray you were watching is a working cut. The DVD is identical. It's a working cut. We're still um, glaring in progress bars. We're still. Uh, we're still begging favors and wearing neckties and smiling at people. you being here and the final thing I want to say is you use the word esthete. Esthete. I, I appreciate that very much. Yeah.